Hope y'all are doing well. Hope you're excited about class tonight. I've been so excited. Um, we had a fabulous meal tonight. We've called it the Believer Soup Kitchen. <laughs> We've had homemade beef, um, vegetable beef soup and chili and um, uh, cornbread and crackers, and so it's been delicious. And so I do want to say um, a special thank you to Kim Bagwell and um, Sherry and Kathy, all those who cook and bring. Some people just take turns, and Gary Broadwater's made some fabulous peanut butter cookies. Not tonight, but he has. But we just come together beforehand, and we eat and meet, and it's just been so, so good. I just love this time of fellowship. A lot of churches aren't doing this right now, and I just think this is such a sweet time of fellowship. And we, we've decided that we really like the um, fellowship hall because we've decided that men do not take notes. Women do, and everybody has their Bibles out and their notebooks and their pens, and so I hope that you're home and ready to do that. And I'm going to try to watch the clock, and um, I'm going to try to get through 17 and 18 pretty quickly so that we can spend some time on chapter 19 where we're going to look and we're going to learn how to uh, mark a few things. And before we get started and pray, I, I do want to say that if you're new to the inductive method, it's okay. Do not be overwhelmed, and you do not have to do it this way in order to be in the lift group. You do not have to. This is just a method that's helped me learn how to study. And so it has just uh, opened this whole thing up for me. And so that's the reason I'm so excited about it, and I always love to introduce it. And so we're only going to mark a few things tonight. And so you can get as involved with it as you want to. And I'll give you a handout after a while with chapter 19 because we are going to use the New American Standard translation so that we will be on the same page. And then you can take your paper home that you've marked and you can uh, transfer your notes over to your translation of choice, okay? So um, if someone does not have pens or pencils or crayons, I brought some and... I'll be glad to share. Uh, this is how I keep mine right here, and most of you all have seen it. And um, I only use this side if I'm going to journal, if I want to use these pens, because these will go through your Bible. And then these are my colored pencils, but you do whatever you want to. And then these are my the Micron 005s that I've stressed, because they will not bleed through your Bible pages. And so um, you can get these online. I put a picture of them on our page um, last week so that everybody could get some. But um, again, you'll enjoy it if you'll be nice to yourself and just kind of adapt just a couple of little things each time. So let's pray and then we'll get started and dive into chapter 17. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to chapter 17 if you haven't already. These girls are ready. I mean, their Bibles are open. They are ready to go. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for um, such a wonderful facility, um, a time that we can come together and eat and, and fellowship, and then we can just pull up and just dine over your word and just um, learn and grow as we study together. And I just thank you, Lord, for your goodness, the blessings uh, that you've bestowed on us to be able to do this and and the lift group, we're all here together, and we just thank you so much for this, this privilege. It truly is a privilege. And so, God, I just ask that you would uh, just clear my heart and my mind, and you just fill my mouth with what you would have me speak tonight, and help us to get through this and um, just learn of you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, chapter 17, we, um, the th out of these 27 verses, there are three things that really stood out to me. Um, when we look at the transfiguration of Jesus and then the deliverance by Jesus and the provision from Jesus in this chapter. And we will talk about those when we get to those particular verses. 
And so we first see that Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and it tells us where that he took them to a high mountain where he was transfigured, he was transformed, he was changed, and you see that in verse 2. And his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. A few verses down in verse 5, we read that while Peter was asking Jesus if he wanted him to build three tabernacles for him, Moses, and Elijah, he was interrupted by a bright cloud and a voice that said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So let's read verses 6 through 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until he, the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, Why then did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. I read a little bit further down, didn't I? Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I meant to read 6 through 9, but y'all have already read it. But when you look down in verses 14 through 21, we have a man amidst the crowd who came up to Jesus. He's falling on his knees saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. And he tells why, for he's a lunatic, very ill. He often falls into the fire and he often into the water. And he said, this is what the man said, I brought him to your disciples. I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't cure him. Verse 17 sets a different tone as Jesus calls them out as unbelieving and a perverted generation. He then asks the disciples, did you see that he asked them two questions? The first one, he asked them, how long shall I be with you? The second question, how long shall I put up with you? And you know what? I, sometimes I think that's probably what he's saying. Like, when are you going to get this? You know. And then he said, bring him here to me. Can you just imagine? Bring him here to me. Now, how many of y'all that have children have said that to your kids? And so I'm thinking here that Jesus may be a little bit on the frustrated side, but, be, but because this tone isn't one that I've read a lot, it struck me a little funny, actually, when he said, bring him here to me. And I wonder if he thinks, again, like the same thing about us. And if I had been Jesus, my thing would have been, because I do this all the time, shh, would you? Would you not have done like, and then the other phrase that I use a lot, some of you all do as well, forever more. <laughs> and then why y'all are wearing me out? I mean, can you just imagine his humanness? And verse 18, Jesus rebuked. And the demon came out of the boy who was cured at once. And the, so that's the deliverance by Jesus that I mentioned at the very beginning of class. And after Jesus took care of business, his disciples then privately asked, why could we not drive it out? And he tells them, they ask and he tells them, because of the littleness of your faith. The King James says, because of your unbelief. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. And this faith was like the woman's faith in the chapter that we read last week. When he referred to the woman, do you all remember, as having great faith. So that lets us know we have a choice. What kind of faith are we going to have? So if you want to look at the word faith, some of you all may have looked that up. I do want to show you um, another word in the next chapter. Some of you probably already know this, those of you who do word studies. 
that the, the two words that we're going to look at, one being faith, is very similar in the uh, definition. They're almost the same. So the original word for faith, if you want to write this down, is P-I-S-T-I-S. P-I-S-T-I-S. And that means assurance. It means belief. It means believe. It means moral conviction, persuasion, and listen to this, the truthfulness of God. That's what faith means. So every time you see the word faith, you, you try to recall some of those definitions. And so beside um, that verse that's talking about faith, I actually have taped an actual mustard seed in my Bible and uh, to remind me every time of the size of that. And we talked about that last week. In fact, if you want a mustard seed to tape in your Bible, I brought a thing of mustard seeds and I brought a little piece of tape for you all so that if you want to put that in your Bible, just remind me to do that. Um, so we read that this um, in Matthew 13, 31, 32, which was a cross-reference to this verse as a reminder of the mustard seed. And um, you, real, you remember that the seed is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that, it tells us why, that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. I love that. And I couldn't help but relate this seed to our faith, and our faith has to grow but in order for our faith to grow, we're going to have to weather some storms. We're going to have to weather the storms. And we're going to have to be deeply rooted in God and his word. And I did not even realize today that this was in my notes, but that is something very specific that I prayed for today. Lord, take root. Take root in my heart and my life. Take your word. I want it to take root in, in me. And you know that our faith does not grow without being challenged. And so, again, remind me, and I will give you some mustard seeds. Now, take note of verse 21. We're still in chapter 17. Jesus said, he's answering the disciples. He says, but this kind does not go out except by, and then he gives you the formula, the prayer and fasting. And fasting is defined as abstinence from a lack of food. And he's giving us instruction here as he did then. Sometimes when there's a situation that we cannot seem to get an answer to or a revelation for, sometimes we have to, re we have to combine the fasting and the praying. And, um, and you will also find that same message in Mark 9, 29. Now, I'm sure that uh, when you read this, uh, pay, you paid close attention to the turn in the conversation beginning in verse 22 and 23. So let's look at that. Um, let's start with verse 24 and we'll just finish it out. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two uh, drachma, tax came to Peter and said, let me see, it's hard to read up here. Does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? He said, yes, and when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. It's a standard coin. You take that and you give it to them for you and me. What I found really interesting about that we went from the conversation of Jesus saying that he was going to be handed, delivered over into the hands 
of men and that they were going to kill him, but that he would be raised on the third day. He went from that conversation to making sure that no one was offended and he was going to be the provision that I talked to you about when we very first started, the provision from Jesus, that coin, to pay the taxes. And I just, a coin, such a small thing, considering what Jesus just said would happen to him. He took care of everything, everything. So for my theme for chapter 17 is mustard seed faith, and that came from verse 20. And the application in chapter 17 for me was choose to have great faith. The second thing that stood out to me for application from this chapter is listen for God's voice through his word. And let me just go one step further and say in order for you to hear his voice through his word, you have to be in it. You have to be in it. And then the third thing, if it was important enough to Jesus to not offend anyone by not paying taxes, it should be that important to us. And I would hope and pray that you as a Christian, a child of God, would not cheat on your taxes. I'm just going to throw that out there. Don't be cheating on your taxes because let me tell you something. He knows. He sees. If it was important enough for Jesus to send him out there to throw a hook out in the water to get the coin to take care of business. Take care of business. The last thing that I found as far as applicable to us is our faith grows through challenges, but our circumstances does not change God. Aren't you glad? It doesn't change who he is or what he's able to do. I'm so thankful for that. So remain faithful. Now, look at chapter 18. And um, I brought a book with me that I'm going to share with you just a little bit of information that I found in this book. Now, let's read, um, let's read uh, verses 1 through 8. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted or unless you turned and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Beside that verse, I have Romans 12, 3 there, if you want to write that down. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. So, unless you're converted, you're turned, and you become like children, this isn't anything for us. Uh, this isn't saying anything for us to be like children in our thinking, rather in our believing, because children believe so easily. And you would know that so well, Ken, by working and doing what you do, and Sandy as well. But verse 4 tells us to humble ourselves as children. And while this isn't a cross reference in my Bible, my mind did go to Romans 12, 3 that I shared with you, and I will read that to you. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So, Earlier in Matthew, when I provided the original definition for faith, I told you that I'd give you the definition of the other word that's very similar in meaning, and uh, you'll see this in the verse, and it's the word believe. 
So the original Greek word is, again, very similar to the faith word, which is P-I-S-T-I-S that I've already given you, and that means assurance, belief, belief, moral conviction, persuasion, and believe is spelled like this in the original language, P-I-S-T-E-U-O, and it means, see, when you see these two words, you're going to be able to relate to them, to have faith in, upon, or with respect to. See how similar they are? They even start out off the same, and it's to entrust. So therefore, those of you who mark your Bible, you can mark the word faith and believe in the same way, which I always do. And then, of course, he says, woe to us if we ever cause one of the little ones who believes to stumble. So in verse 7, the King James uses the word offenses in places of stumbling blocks. And if you will look up in your original Greek uh, definition there, you'll see that it means a scandal, a snare, an occasion of fall, and a stumbling block. So my translation says stumbling block, which means the exact same thing as what the King James says. And so it's the same thing. So we do not want to be the woman or the man from whom a stumbling block comes. And then later in verse 10, we're told not to despise one of the little ones. So in verses 12 through 14, we have the story about the shepherd going to look for the stray for, which I'm thankful for that. I just spoke on that last week. Because it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. And besides verse 11 and 14, I have the names of the people that I pray for in my Bible beside those two verses. If you read uh, verse 15, it says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. And beside that passage of Scripture, I have 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. If you want to look over there really quick, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So clearly these verses are talking about our brother in the Lord and to make certain that I was understanding this verse, along with verses 16 through 19 that you've already read, I spoke with a local pastor, as I have in times past, and he admitted that he has done the same thing that I have done by taking one of these passages out of context. And what we have here is some references in church discipline, this chapter right here in uh, chapter 18 where we are. It's talking about sin, it's talking about discipline, forgiveness, and loosing. So I'm not sure what the side notes are in your Bible concerning verse 18, but mine reads like this. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind, whatever you forbid on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose, meaning permit, on earth, shall have been loosed in heaven. Verse 19, here's the verse that I have taken out of context. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on each about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father or from my Father who is in heaven. Now remember in verse 16 we read where it says, take one or two with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. You need a witness. In verse 20, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. But the pastor that I spoke with, again, said that he had taken that particular verse out of context to agree with others on a particular matter and prayed about it. 
He did not say that there is anything wrong, and we all know this. There's certainly not anything wrong with two or three or four or how many ever people coming together to pray about something in particular. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying about this passage, this is talking about church discipline. And I did not realize that. But when we looked at the scripture together and just started going through that, I was like, yeah, and the passages of scripture above that, in front of that, that's exactly what it was talking about. So I was so glad that I called him and we talked about it. Um, it, it again, it's talking about church discipline, forgiveness, and, and by us loosing them, it's forgiving them. Now, read verse 21 and 22, chapter 18. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, he asks. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times what? Seven. Seventy times seven is how many times we're supposed to forgive. And before I called that one pastor to discuss this, I pulled out a book written by a local pastor here in Kingsport that was given to me. And um, I, for whatever reason, I pulled it out because I wanted to look something up. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's called The Journey by Pastor Donnie Brannon. And this is not who I had the, you want to zoom in? This is not who I had the conversation with about that passage of Scripture. But I wanted a second opinion, you see, just to make sure. And so... Um, I, I want to share a, a particular part of our passage. Did you get it, honey? Um, from his book in just a minute. When we're talking about forgiveness, thankfully that's not one of my hang-ups. I have some. But unforgiveness is not something that um, I hold on to. You may have a problem with that. You may struggle with that. I don't know. That's between you and God. But I want to read something, and it's so funny that we were just having this conversation, Kim, in the kitchen about unforgiveness, um, about a situation that we're aware of. But this is what Pastor Donnie Brannon wrote in his book, and it's a devotion, and there is a chapter on every chapter in the New Testament. It says, but God in his mercy, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, freely forgave us when we came to him in repentance, placing our faith in Christ and surrendering our lives to his lordship. Jesus paid the price for our sins so we could go free. In light of how much we've been forgiven, it is inexcusably wicked for us to refuse to forgive others. Whatever they may have done to us, it pales in comparison to what our sins did to Christ. Refusing to forgive locks us away in a prison of our own bitterness, removed from fellowship, though not relationship, removed from fellowship with God, and bereft of many of the joys of being a Christian. Three quick points need to be made about forgiveness. Number one, true forgiveness is, is not just external. Jesus said we must forgive from the heart. We can tell someone, I forgive you and act like all is well while we're still harboring thoughts of bitterness or revenge. Second thing, true forgiveness is an act of the will. We think of the heart as the seat of the emotions, but the Greeks saw it as the seat of the will, if you're waiting for some wonderful feeling, some emotional wave of forgiveness to just wash over you, you'll never forgive. Forgiveness is not a feeling. 
we choose to forgive out of obedience to God's command, not because we feel like forgiving, but when we truly forgive, the feelings will follow. I love that. Third, forgiveness is a decision made today that must be reiterated tomorrow. Forgiveness is a decision made today that must be reiterated tomorrow. And last thing, after the decision to forgive is made at some point in the future, something will bring that offense to mind yet again. At that point, we must decide whether to reiterate that forgiveness or revoke that forgiveness. I thought that was so good. Again, if you want a copy of this book, reach out to Vicki Haynes. He is the pastor of their church. I have sat in a brief Bible study under him. He is an excellent, and all of his credentials are on the back of this book. He's a very, very smart man and got a very, very sweet spirit about him. But I just thought that in our society, forgiveness is not something that is talked about a lot. And that's something that should be done often. And... Um, Forgiveness is a pretty big deal. We don't want to be bound in that unforgiveness for someone. And whether you did anything wrong or not is not the point. It's really not the point. So my theme for chapter 18 is forgive. 70 times 70. And that was found in verse 22. Some of the application things that I found in this chapter is humble ourselves as a child, believe as easily as a child does, never be a stumbling block. Don't cause offense, don't be offensive. If you know not assuming that your brother in Christ is in sin, go to him in love. Reach out to him, her, and help them find their way. And of course, the last thing is to forgive others. And if that's something that you struggle with, pray about it. I mean, pray about it because it's a big deal. And I, I know that I kind of skipped over verses 23 and 20, uh, through 34. You've read it. Um, but I, I wanted to do that because I just happened to look at the clock, and I do want to spend some time in chapter 19 as we um, start looking at some uh, the inductive method to review. Now, if you do not have pencils or pens, Rick, can you hand this out for, for me? I, some of them have this. Vicki gave this to them Saturday, so if you have your sheets, uh, get those out if you haven't already. We're just going, again, to review. This is very, very brief. And while he's handing those out, um, let me say there are a few words that I mark the exact same way throughout my Bible, which I've put on the board, and there are others, but I didn't, there's not enough room on this right here, but I just wanted to give you some examples of how I mark these words every time in my Bible throughout. And um, you can create your own. This is, this is just my way. You do you. And uh, you have, if you have the new inductive study Bible in the front of that Bible, you have um, several examples of how to mark passages of Scripture. Uh, did you see that in the front of your Bible? Yeah, it's, it's right there in the front. Um, yeah, and so there are several things, places that you can look at in that particular Bible. By the way, if you want that Bible, it's on sale. Uh, it's the lowest price I've ever seen. It's $41.99, and it's free shipping right now, and I put the code on there. But it ends tonight. Now, also, um, these... The markings that I do are kind of excessive because I've been doing it a, a long time. 
So I don't recommend that you do everything that I do, especially starting now. What I want you to do tonight is to mark three things as we go through chapter uh, 19, as we go through this. And I want you to get a yellow pen or a yellow crayon color, whatever. And if you need mine, I have, you need some? Anytime that you come to the name Jesus, I always use the color yellow. And I color him yellow because he is light and it's easy to see and spot. So the, tonight when we go through chapter 19, we're only going to mark three things. And Jesus being one of them. And then you're going to, I want you to mark the time phrase with a green cloth. You see this right here? That's where those little pins that I sh told you uh, comes in handy because you can use that micron 005. It's not going to go through your page. So anytime I see a time frame, that's what I put because you know what? There's some significance in that, and you'll see that. And then in this particular chapter, you can use an orange or whatever color you want to color your Pharisee. I color mine orange. I just take a a uh, colored pencil, and color Pharisees, orange. So um, after this is over, I'm going, I've asked Vicki, and she's probably already, um, she probably already has it ready and scheduled to show you my markings, and she's going to post that on our site tonight. Um, so be sure and have your pencils and pens ready now, I'm going to read through chapter 19. And when I come to a word that you need to mark, I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask you to talk back to me by using this piece of paper because we're all going to be on the same translation, okay? So, the very first word that I marked is the word when because that is a time phrase. So, I just drew me a little green clock right on top of that, when. So, when, Jesus, what are you going to do with Jesus? Yes. When Jesus had finished these words, who departed? Jesus. So what are you going to do with that? Color it yellow. Just do one at a time. Now let me tell you, if you were in precept, if you were in Chattanooga, here's what they would do. We don't have time. She would read this chapter to you. And every time she read this chapter, every time she would read this chapter, you would have to read it three different times to just mark the things individually. And here's why she does this. Because of comprehension. Every time you read it, you're going to read it. You would read it three times. Well, let me tell you something. By the end of reading it three times, you're going to know chapter 19. You're going to know that chapter. So slow down. Take your time. This is your quiet time. This is your time with the Lord. He wants to speak to you through his word, and he wants to show you some things. It's okay if you read the chapter three and four times. So when Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed who? Jesus. And who healed them? He. Yes. So you would mark, yes, that, that feedback is what I need. Y'all speak up because they need to hear you. Some who? Pharisees? What are you going to do with that? All right. Some Pharisees came to who? Testing who? Yes. And asking is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Verse 4. And he, yes, answered and said, Have you, who's that? Pharisees, yes. Have you not read that? Yes. He created them from when? Beginning. Is that a time frame? Yes. 
And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God, and I showed you how I marked God, but I always color that yellow, and you're not doing that right now, but that's just FYI. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They, who were the they? Pharisees, right. So you're going to color the they orange, yes. So the Pharisees said to who? Yes. Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He, yes, said to them, who's them? Right. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives but from the beginning yes it has not been this way y'all are so good and the thing about it is when you've done this and you look at it you're going to look right there and you're going to know who they are who he is that's another thing I love about my new American standard he is always capitalized him is always capitalized. He is, and I love that. Okay, what verse are we on? Nine. And I, who is I? Jesus. And I say to, yes, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to, yes. If the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. But, yes, he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. Now, another word that I always mark, and I think I told you this last week, that you're not doing this tonight, is the word but, because that's always a contrast. When I see the word but, I take a blue pen and I put a square around that because there, it's causing me to see what the contrast is. Okay? Verse 12. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Now... If I, because I'm at home and I'm studying and I'm thinking, well, my goodness, Unix is all over that, over and over and over. What am I going to do with that? Because it is a key repeated phrase, yes. Sheila said you're going to mark it. I just took a green pencil and I just marked it green because I want to see who that is talking about. Who is that? Okay. Verse 13. Then, what are you going to do with that? Time frame. Yeah, you're going to put you a little clock right there. Then some children were brought to who? So that, yes, might lay his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. Who is it that he rebuked? The children. See, if you were marking that passage you would automatically see I just basically took a, a pencil a color pencil and I underlined children every single time because I want to know who was rebuked verse 14 but Jesus said let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to who me talking about that's Jesus there for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these meaning the children verse 15 after laying his yes hands on them he Jesus departed from there verse 16 and someone came to and said 
All right, you're going to mark that the same way. Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, and he, Jesus, said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he, then, after all this, then, that's a time phrase, he said to him, who's him? Yes. Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit, a, uh, commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witnesses. Verse 19, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to, yes, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Verse 21 starts off with who? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow. Yes, but when the young man heard this statement. He went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Verse 23. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 24, again, I, Jesus, say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 25, when, time phrase, when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Every time I see the word all, this is what I do. I put me a red block, a box right around it. All things are possible. Beside that passage of scripture, you can write Luke one thirty seven beside that, and just an FYI, because the disciples had just asked Jesus, who then can be saved? Beside verse 26, I have my family members written in my Bible right there. With, all, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Verse 27, then, meaning after, then Peter said to who? Jesus. <laughs> Now listen, let me, let me say this. When you are reading, for example, chapter 19, read all the way through that one time and mark one word at a time. Go through chapter 19 and mark every reference to Jesus, he, him, one time because you've got one pencil in your hand. The next time you go and you read it again, and you pick out that other something that stood out to you, who they're talking about, who they're talking to. Go back and read that again. So what if you spend an hour in one chapter? You going to know it by that time? Absolutely you are. Verse 27, Then Peter said to him, Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed who? Jesus, what then will there be for us, he asked. And Jesus said to them, truly I, Jesus, say to you, and he's talking to the disciples there, which I have a, a color for them, that you who have followed, yes, me, y'all talk to me so they can hear you, in the regeneration, when, time phrase, yes, very good, Rick. When the Son of Man, who's the Son of Man? Okay, what you going to do with that? 
You're going to color it. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall, sh shall sit upon 12 thrones. That was hard right there for me to say all that. Whew. <laughs> um, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for whose name's sake? Jesus, yes, my namesake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, let me, let me just kind of hurry up and close this up. Are y'all confused? Verse, chapter 19, here's my thing. With God, all things are possible. That is the one thing that stood out to me. With God, all things are possible. And that was found in verse 26. If you have the new inductive study Bible, if you will turn in your Bible at the very end of Matthew, the very last page of Matthew, you are going to find chapter things. And that's where you would put all of those things. And for a quick reference, guess what? I can go and I can tell you that chapter 1 is the genealogy of Jesus. I can tell you that chapter 2 is the journey of the child. Chapter 3, John baptizes Jesus. You know why? Because I transferred all of those chapter things over to that page. That's a quick reference guide right there for me. So I can tell you that in chapter 4, Jesus' ministry began. I can tell you that the Beatitudes are found in chapter 5. And I can tell you that in chapter 6, we are to give, we are to pray, we are to forgive, we are to fast, and don't worry. So if you don't forget... For those of you who have this Bible, to transfer those tra uh, chapter themes over on that. Because if somebody says, where is it in Matthew? Where, the, where are the Beatitudes? If you can't remember immediately, go to that page in your Bible, and you can say chapter 5, the Beatitudes. So this is your workbook, y'all. This is where you're going to find him. This is where you're going to know him and learn of him. And once you start doing this a little bit at a time, you're going to love it if you'll be nice to yourself and stick with it. Now, the application is do not hinder children from coming to Jesus. The second thing that I found interesting or applicable to this chapter is rest in knowing that with God all things are possible. We can rest in that. And the last thing is follow Jesus with everything in us. So now you are in, you've already gone all the way through 19 chapters of 28 chapters in Matthew. From this point on, Mark one or two things from chapters 20 to 28. Pick one thing. Everybody can mark one thing, right? Just color Jesus. I always just color Jesus yellow. And when I first started out, I always did this. I always just put the cross right there. You mark it however you want to, how you will know, and you'll be able to see it. And it, how it will stand out to you because at first glance you're going to look at that and you're going to know that's Jesus. Because not every translation has his name, him or he, capitalized. Of course, Jesus is obvious because that's his name here. And you can see that. But when it gets to he and him, you don't know it unless you mark it in particular translations. You want to know who he's talking to and see what I did in the margins, which is why Vicki, thank you, Vicki, for making these margins so wide because it's what I did because we were talking about the eunuchs. So over there in the margin, I put eunuchs, verse 12, 
because that whole verse is about eunuchs. In verses 13 through 15, I put the word children because I can look at that at first glance. We're talking about eunuchs. We're talking about children. Okay, and then in verse 16 through 22, we're talking about the young man. And so I just took a brown pencil and I just underlined it every time I saw young man and him and who that was in reference to. And then in verse 23 and 24, in the margin of my Bible, I put rich. Every time I see the word rich, you know what I do? I take that green pen and I put dollar signs right over rich just so that I can see that. And right now, if I want to know what the rich man says or what he said about the rich man, I can look for that dollar sign. It is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then, of course, the disciples, I have them marked in a color. I just, I just colored them a color. And I have that in the margin of my Bible that says he's talking about the disciples in verses 27 through 30. So I hope that it helped you more than it overwhelmed you. So from chapter 20 through 28, you pick what you want to mark and mark at least one or two things. Tonight you marked three. I have been in classes where people's had, they've had so many um, colored pencils in one hand and they couldn't hardly hold them and they would, they would fall out of their hands and they just get so overwhelmed. But listen, just do one or two things, okay? And it's going to really, really stand out to you, and I hope that that helped you. Again, Vicki is going to post my notes from my page um, on our website so that you can have some general idea of what my page looks like. And it's not so that your can, yours can look like mine. It's just to give you some examples. Um, we can't make copies here, can we? It's, uh, as far as color, like this right here, I don't know if it would come out, but, I mean, you can look at it and see. Um, but let, and I'll give this, you want to take this and see, um, but these are just some words that over here that I do, I use it with devotion and prayer, up right here, I always do this open right here with purple, and I always color with pink crayons for prayer, but I leave that open, because when we pray, we're, le we're opening, we're keeping the lines of communication open, so I never close that right there, so it's just always... God, of course, is the Trinity. And so um, those are just some examples that I gave you. But let's pray. And if you have any questions, I'm going to be here after. If, if you have questions, please write them down. And I'll read the comments when I get home. And uh, I hope that you all have enjoyed this and that you've learned from it. Uh, again, just take your time when you study his word and you use the translation of your choice, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much again for the time that we get to come together and look carefully and closely at your word because the whole point of opening up the word is to find you in it and have more of you be reflected in and through our lives. God, help us to make you and your word a priority because I know there's nothing more important than spending time alone with you in your word. Lord, teach us and give us a hunger for your word. And Lord, I pray that this precious word will invade our hearts and lives and change us through and through and that you will sanctify us and that we will forgive easily, that we will be honest, that we will be full of faith and belief in you and who you are. And Lord, help us to share with others what you have taught us through studying your word. Make it to where we can't keep it to ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.